Chapter 8 Into Italy Bella Fiore Cento lira la botte Beautiful flowers A hundred lira the bunch Crying out my wares in the cities I might, I'm making my way across Italy Here in the, in the verdant north There's an abundance of flowers Which I gather and sell in the high street For a hundred lira the bouquet Hey presto I fill my belly With bottles of cool white vino to farm me I swing out along the road singing arias in, in an invented Italian. I'm on my way to Venice. I've heard it's full of water and full of dreams. I skirt Milan, crossing a bridge which spans a dry, dried up river. I espy some tents pitched a little way down the riverbed. Gypsies! My heart misses a beat and I climb down the sides of the bridge. Two youths look up and watch my approach from the bonnet of a clapped out car. Jala, I hail them. They ignore my greeting and stare at me. Inglesi? asks one of them. Si, say I. Vieni qua. Help us with this engine. I understand him to be saying, get underneath, I'll take your rucksack. Be careful, Tata had warned. There are some of us who will try to trick you, to rob you. Just watch out, be careful. His words came back to me, but I got under the car, and suddenly wondered, what on earth am I doing here? All of a sudden I'm wriggling out and diving into the tent, where I find the fellow with my passport in his hand. Damn on, I shout, give it to me! I snack it, snatch it from his hand, grab my belongings and flee. Stones whistle past my ear as I do so. Guard your blonde, I can hear Manny say. I was a gadjo there, but I'll tell you something that happened a while back when I was still in France. I was in Aix-en-Provence. It was evening, darkness was falling, I was strolling along a back street, and two gitons, every sinew in my body could tell they, they were trouble, were heading straight for me. Tata had warned me about the gitons. They're aggressive, he'd said. More than we are. Be wary of them. I took a deep breath. They were upon me. I don't like your face, said one of them, jabbing me with his finger. Nor do I, joined, the, joined in the other. There was no way out of this. There was no point in running. I wouldn't have got far. No point in crying for help. No one would come. They were going to kick my head in. It was just a matter of a few formalities, like telling me they didn't like my face, that I was a piece of shit, and then, and then they'd start. But they were gypsies. They'd be superstitious. If I threw all the weight of my fear at them and pierced their eyes with mine and turned things around. Do you believe in black magic, I asked. What do you mean, black magic, they snarled. I mean, black magic, I said. I, I can see your mother now. She's just climbing the steps into your caravan. What do you mean you can see our mother, sneered the one who jabbed me in the stomach. I can see your mother... And with one mo movement of my, of my hand, I can, I can cause her to fall and break her neck. What are you fucking talking about? I could see they were getting alarmed. What I'm talking about is this, that one movement of my hand, and I started to move my right hand towards my left. And as soon as my hands touch, your mother will die. And I shouted with all the fury I could muster into their faces. No, 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 friend, they screamed. Don't do it. We are your friends. You are our friend. Let us shake your hand. We are friends. We shook hands. They slinked away. What untellable relief. I never thought I'd swing that one. I'm leaning from the window of a steam train as we glide over the lagoon to, to Venice, Venice which rises up like a dream from the water. I'm not sure it's not a dream as I descend the station steps to a waterfront teeming with little boats and a bridge arcing over it like a rainbow. It could be the bridge that links heaven and earth, I think, enraptured. 
It could be the bridge that links heaven and earth, I think, enraptured, with the blessed passing to and fro over it. Well, <laughs> perhaps not so blessed, I mused, leaning over its parapet, smoking a cigarette and listening to the jarring accents of American tourists as they pass by in droves. Gee, I hear one of them say, I like Paris so much I stayed there a whole weekend. Guess I'll stay here a couple of days too. I, I take my shoes off to feel the warm flagstones beneath my feet and wander around the labyrinth of alleys, through the little squares and over bridges big and small. Everywhere is the lapping of water against the ancient walls. Towers rise up from the waterfronts. Sonorous bells strike and clang and peal, and priests in flowing garments rush by. Gondolas glide under the bridges with their car cargoes of tourists, steered by slick gondol gond gondoliers in boaters and striped shirts, who sing of love and romance beneath Italian skies. I dream like everyone else when I lean over a bridge in the evening, tipsy with wine, and listen to snatches of song drifting over the water. I can let some tears fall. Some lines of Yeats haunt me as I wander through the alleys at night, taking a swig from a bottle and abandoning myself to unrestrained emotion. Consume my heart away, sick with desire, and fasten to a dying animal. It knows not what it is. Lamb's a Londoner, a happy-go-lucky trickster. He's made his down, way down to Venice after a few months in Munich, mugging businessmen. Ah, I, ju I just pick pockets now, he tells me. I'm not violent by nature. It's just that sticking those fat businessmen up against a wall with a knife after they come piss and staggering out of the beer houses was the easiest thing to do. Kids play it was. I had no scruples. Businessmen are robbing us. Hard fuckers they are. But I'd have them squealing. We're in St Mark's Square, sitting on the steps of the little tower, when many, where many sit in the evening, listening to the violins playing on the cafe terraces. We're sharing a bottle of wine. Two American girls sit down on the step below us. They're pretty. Perhaps we'll get to know each other. But then I see Lamb's hand in the handbag of one of them. You can't, I breathe, incredulous. I can and I have, says he, slipping something into his breast pocket. Come in. I, I, come on. And he pulls me by the sleeve towards one of the alleys that leads out of the square. There's nearly a hundred dollars in the purse. In the purse. I accept the meal in the, in the swish restaurant Lamb offers me. You've earned it as my accomplice he says, and the pizza I'm tucking, it, tucking into sticks in my throat. However much Lamb tries to persuade me, promising to teach me all the tricks of the trade, I cannot bring myself to picking pockets. It just seems so sneaky to me. Even mugging seems more honest, though I'm definitely not going to try my hand at that. I agree with him that most people can afford to be relieved of the contents of their pockets because they've got more in the bank, as he would put it, but I just can't bring myself to taking things off another's person like that. And yet I wouldn't have any scruples about robbing a bank when they've, well, when they've got the rest of their loot. That's different altogether, like stealing from supermarkets. They can afford it. I can do that all right. It's a shame, says my cockney pal. We could have worked together as a team. We'd make millions with all the tourists about. <laughs> I, I like Lamb. I, I met him whilst drinking a coffee in the station canteen. He'd been hanging around the bookstall, eye, eyeing up the tourists arriving on the trains. I saw him go up to several girls, trying to chat them up, I suppose, in order to relieve them of their worldly riches. He wasn't having much luck, getting rebuffed all the time, and after a while he headed towards the canteen for some refreshment. He made straight for my table with his cup of tea. English, he asked. Yeah. Can I join you? That's when I heard all about his business. It's a singe in Venice, but there's all the eye ties on the game, and they're good. There's a bit of a mafia, and they don't like me doing what they're doing. I have to watch out, because they're kind of territorial, if you know what I mean. I'm only around the station in the morning, because in the afternoon and the evening, they're all, all around here, flocks of them, waiting for the trains to come in. 
and they don't like to see me hanging around waiting for the trains to come in. He laughed. He's often laughing. I, li I like that about him. And it may sound strange, but I like his openness and his honesty. Plus, he's generous to a tea with his pals. Have another coffee and a cake or something on me. And he went up to the counter and came back with a tray of, full of croissant, cakes and frothing ca cappuccinos. It's a good life here. I live well, he smiled. I keep out of the way of, of the mafia and no one bothers me. Not even the police. I make my living quietly, you see. I live in a little hotel in the Lido, my own private bathroom, a view over the lagoon. Yeah, yeah, mate, it's, uh, <laughs> it's the life of a millionaire. Well, almost. <laughs> Compared to the life I was living in London, it is, uh, in a squat in Hackney with a lot of downonites and junkies. Jesus, I wouldn't go back there if you paid me. Where are you sleeping, mate? I told him I usually picked a different spot every night by the sides of the canals, on the steps of the church, anywhere. Just make sure you hide yourself well, he advised me. These eye ties are in full operation at night. They'll get everything away from you and then slash your feet through your sleeping bag so you can't, can't run after them. Yeah, they don't play around. A train was pulling in. That's a 10.45 from Milan, said Lamb, getting up. I never miss it, this one. Catch your back. No, for all his tempting promises of riches and the good life, I'm not going to become his accomplice. I'll ply my own trade, humble as it may be. Not finding any parks in Venice, and therefore no flowers, I go to the flower market to see if I can find any thrown away from which I can assemble some bouquets. An old lady at one of the stalls sees me scrabbling about in the boxes and asks me what I'm looking for. Old flowers? She looks bemused and smiles. Come in the evening, six o'clock, and I'll give you all the flowers you want. And so, at night, with an abundance of flowers of all varieties, I hawk my wares around the cafes and restaurants, or sit on the bridges and sell them to young lovers as they pass me, wrapped in love with one another. No, Lamb, I'm sorry, but nothing could induce me to pick their pockets. It's kind of incongruous to come across the Cockney in Venice. Something of London always hovers about him like an aura, though he doesn't look altogether un-Italian as he slouches against a wall, whistling at the girls, what with his small, wiry statue and his greased-back, jet-black hair. No, he doesn't look out of place. It's when he opens his mouth. Blimey, mate, he says to me, talking about accents, you've got a right toffs one there. Where were you, Oxford or something? No, I never got that far. But some kind of posh school, then. Well, yeah, I was posh. <laughs> I got kicked out. You did, did you? says Lamb, interested. What was that for, spending all the time in the pub? He casts a wry smile at the bottle raised to my lips. <laughs> no, I was never caught in the pub. It was lots of things together. The final thing was cutting a bell rope. Huh, that sounds like an enterprising thing to do. What happened? You upset the timetable? Yeah. You see, there was this big, big bell which hung over the roof of one of the buildings, the, the porter's lodge, where the porter lived. He used to ring the bell, first of all in the morning, to get us up, up, all up out of bed. It was a boarding school, yeah? Yeah. Girls sleeping there too? A few. A few? Blimey, what do you do, share them round? Well, no, not exactly. Posh girls, I suppose they were, with frightfully rich daddies. Yes, I suppose they were, I laugh. Lamb mimicking an Oxford accent is even more amusing, and he realises. So you stopped the bell ringing. Yeah, one night in the summer town, I climbed out of my dormitory window with a knife over the root rooftops in my pyjamas and cut the rope which the porter pulled down on down below. In the morning, the bell didn't ring, so no one got up. The servants were in the dining hall waiting to dollop up breakfast, they waited all morning, and all the lessons were late. I was proud of the havoc I, I caused. I'd put a spoke in the works. <sighs> I'm impressed, mate. What happened then? A short interview with the, the authorities? Yes, a short interview, and uh, that was the end of my school career. Well done, mate. I'm proud of you. I <laughs> bet your old man wasn't proud of you, though, was he? Well, I think it gave me some concern for my future. Well, you wouldn't be here if you'd gone on studying and learning, would you? I don't know where you'd be, but you wouldn't be here. You'd probably be in office or something. There we are, sitting in the sun in Venice, dang 